You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for September 1st, 2022. This week, an ESC review, part two. The first thing to say about ESC was how nice it was to have a real medical meeting again. I mean, the buzz of the convention felt normal. Hugging colleagues and friends felt normal. Seeing people smile really felt normal. And dinner from eight till midnight felt highly Southern Mediterranean. And shocking to me was how busy La Rumbla was after midnight. I mean, there were children still at dinner tables. Now, the second thing to say about ESC is how grateful and happy I was that so many of you came up and said hello to me and even mentioned the podcast. I mean, every week I speak into this microphone and I'm never sure how it is received. So thank you. And as always, please rate and review the podcast because this helps others find it. I don't know if it was the two-year break that brought so many studies, but my gosh, ESC 2022 has much to talk about. And I'll break this up into two, maybe three more podcasts, because really 25 limits is a good limit on podcast length. Also note that last week, I covered the TIME study, which was daytime versus nighttime taking of blood pressure tablets, the SECURE study, which was polypill and secondary prevention, and the CAPLA study, PVI versus PVI plus posterior wall ablation in patients with persistent AFib. Those were early uh, trials on Friday morning at ESC. The first topic today is going to be the revived BCIS trial. Now, it's so weird, isn't it? Percutaneous coronary intervention, or PCI, is one of cardiology's really medicine's greatest modern achievements when it is used to open an acutely occluded coronary artery during the MI. Now, I'm old enough to remember treating MI patients with morphine and Swanson's catheters. But when a patient with an MI gets off the table with a Band-Aid on their wrist and is fixed, I don't take that for granted. But, but, the use of PCI for any other coronary obstruction has never been shown to reduce MI or extend life compared against tablets. MAS-2, COURAGE, berry 2 d ischemia were all null outcome trials for PCI and stable disease. So British investigators designed the revived BCIS trial, or revived for short, to be the perfect setup for PCI to beat standard care. Now, check out how well they teed this up for PCI. Patients had to have left ventricular dysfunction. The mean EF in this study was 27%. They had to have severe multivessel coronary disease, and the lesions had to be amenable to PCI. And there had to be lots of myocardial viability. Now, picture this kind of patient in a cath lab. Imagine a cardiologist thinking that all these lesions were not important to fix. Imagine thinking, oh, well, we'll just leave these blockages be. This was the scenario in Revived. They randomized these patients to PCI or medical therapy. And over 3.5 years, there was not a shred of difference in the primary outcome of death or heart failure hospitalizations. The secondary outcome of improvement of left ventricular ejection fraction also did not budge. And at two years, quality of life did not differ. So comments. Now, come on, you all. How many times has this podcast discussed studies that disprove our beliefs? The first thing to say about Revived pertains to the larger context. That is, whenever you think it's not ethical to do a trial, you should think about Revived or CAST or the Women's Health Initiative or Courage and or the TTM trials or a list of about 100 more. 
Randomized controlled trials are the greatest medical intervention of the modern era. Who, I mean, who would have thought that restoring blood flow without the early mortality signal seen in the surgical stitch trials with cabbage to weak but viable myocardium would not have budged outcomes against medicines? Now, I see two specific things to say about revived. First is that this shows the power of tablets, modern medical therapy. I mean, we cardiologists are doers, right? We fix things firsthand. It gives us this rush of adrenaline, and perhaps it is that rush that messes with our rationality. When we fix things like blocked vessels, it feels more effective than mere tablets. But statins and aspirin for coronary disease and the big four classes of drugs for left ventricular systolic dysfunction, that forms a high bar. These agents have all been shown to improve outcomes. Now, the second thing to say about Revived is that it is yet more evidence that the clogged pipe frame of modern cardiology is flawed. Now, I wrote a column on this trial, and in it, I speculate that this frame of reference will only change with funerals, like Max Planck said. It will take a new generation, and I bet that future generations, 10, 20, 30 years on, they'll have sessions on how and why this generation was so impervious to evidence. Kudos to the King's College London team, not only for their execution of this trial, but more for their courage in doing it. Okay, second great trial is the Dan Kavas trial. I sometimes think people in my office are sick of me constantly running around saying that we help people. But it's true. I really love this job of doctoring because it has great meaning to help people who are sick. And that last phrase is key people who are sick. Medicine is pure when we treat people with illness. But it is way, way harder to help people who have no complaints. I mean, when someone grades their health and vitality as an A, how can you make them any better? In this case, we can only prevent things from happening in the future. And that's the problem that Wilson and Younger described 50 years ago. They said prevention is admirable, but in real life, there are snags. And so that was the task that Axel Diedrichsen, the PI, and his Danish colleagues had in the Dan Kavas trial. They aimed to test whether a constellation of cardiac tests delivered in a shockingly efficient manner would improve survival. Not heart failure hospitalizations, not CV death, but all-cause death. And my friends, the point of any screening trial is not to reduce one kind of death because there are infinite ways to die. The only endpoint of screening should be overall survival. And the Danish investigators didn't test this in a place like the southeastern United States where rates of obesity and inactivity and smoking drive high rates of death from cardiac causes. No, they tested prevention in Denmark, a country known for its good health and good health care system. Here's what they did in the trial. 45,000 individuals were identified and researchers randomized one third of them to an invitation to attend this comprehensive cardiac screening and two thirds got no invitation. They were the control group. Of those invited to screening, only about 63% attended. But the main comparison here was between the invited and the uninvited. Now the screening process was unique enough to warrant telling you about. Get this, the whole thing took about 40 minutes. On arrival to screening, participants completed a questionnaire, then had their height, weight, and blood pressures in both the upper and lower extremities taken, so that's the ABI index. They then underwent a CT scan starting at the jaw and panning down to the femoral region. The scans only assessed for coronary calcium and aortic aneurysms, nothing else. While the patients were in the scanner, a rhythm strip was taken during the scan, and so they got rhythm monitoring. Then the patient had blood drawn for lipids and glucose. Also remarkable is that technologists read the CT scans only for coronary calcium and aortic sizes. There were no radiologists. Those patients who had abnormalities had follow-up visits and were offered lifestyle recommendations, smoking cessation, medicines, including aspirin, statins, whatever. And follow-up of outcomes was through the Danish Health Registry. It was planned for 10 years, but this report at ESC was a five-year update. So the findings... After a median follow-up of 5.6 years, 12.6% of the screen group died versus 13.1% of the non-screen group. 
That's a hazard ratio of 0.95, a 5% reduction in death. The conference intervals went from 0.90 to 1.00, so that's up to a 10% reduction in death to no reduction, and the p-value was 0.06. Now, secondary outcomes such as stroke, MI, and aortic dissection and rupture all favored the screened arm. There was an interesting subgroup. Invitation to screening was associated with a significant 11% reduction in mortality in men who were aged 65 to 70 years, but this was not seen in those older than 70 years. Here, the hazard ratio was right at 1.01. Now, invitation to screening led to more prescriptions for antiplatelet drugs and lipid-lowering drugs, but there were no differences in the use of PCI, coronary artery bypass surgery, or vascular surgery. Let me repeat, there was no increase in PCI or uh, revascularization procedures. And in a separate paper, and sit down for this, the authors reported that the average difference in healthcare costs between the two groups was... 207 euros per invitee. Okay, my comments. First is that I have a column on this, and I hope you read it. There's more details there. But first, despite this p-value of 0.06, Dan Kavaz was a positive trial. I say that because the majority of the conference interval includes a lower rate of death. It went from 0.90 to 1.0. And remember, the endpoint here was death, not some other surrogate. And also remember that there's nothing material dif different at a p-value of 0.06 or 0.04. Okay, second comment. The subgroup showing that younger men did much better persuades me. Slightly younger men would stand to benefit more from cardiac screening because they have fewer competing causes of death than older men. The effect of competing causes of death was shown and widely accepted in the subgroup analysis of the Danish trial of internal cardiac defibrillators and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Here, younger patients garnered substantial benefit from the ICD, while older patients did not. This is accepted. Now, putting this in context, compare the Dan Kavas screening strategy to the accepted and codified annual health check, which is, in a sense, screening, right? Well, Cochrane reviewed 17 trials of general health checks and found with high certainty little to no effect on the risk of death from any cause. Now let me say something about translating this trial. Here, the trial environment always factors in how we apply our results, and in Dan Kavas, the avoidance of overdiagnosis and overtreatment cannot be understated. There were no increases in CATH, PCI, or cabbage in the screen group, so no one should be tempted to use Dan Kavaz to support coronary artery calcium screening outside of this specific setting. In our lengthy conversation, Professor Diedrichsen emphasized that Danish doctors do not feel compelled to look for ischemia in asymptomatic patients even if they have a high calcium score. And I may not have believed him had I not seen healthcare firsthand in that country. The methodology and results of Dan Kavas should be studied, appreciated, but not overextended. This is not a roadmap for what to do tomorrow, especially in systems outside of Denmark. Rather, I see it as a reason to question our status quo and plan more studies. This is what good science does. And kudos to Professor Diedrichsen and his co-investigators. All right, third topic is the DELIVER trial, dapagliflozin in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. Now, even before the ESC meeting, we knew from a press release that the trial met its primary endpoint of a heart failure event, mostly heart failure hospitalization, and cardiovascular death. At ESC, we got the specifics. But recall first that the Emperor Preserved, we already know that trial, this is a similar trial of empagliflozin versus placebo and HEFPEF. That also met its primary endpoint, but it was driven by heart failure hospitalizations without significant reductions in CV death. So in DELIVER, 6,200 plus patients, 72 years old, 44% female, and 75% had class 2 New York Heart Association, heart failure with a mean ejection fraction of 54%. Now, primary endpoint occurred in 16.4% of the DAPA group, 
versus 19.5% placebo. That's an absolute risk reduction of 3.1%, and the hazard ratio or relative risk reduction was 0.82 or an 18% relative risk reduction. The driver of that primary endpoint, like it was in Emperor Preserved, was heart failure events. In Deliver, it was a 21% reduction with conference intervals ranging from 0.69 to 0.93, so significant. So in a trial of more than 6,200 patients carried on for more than two years, there were 87 fewer heart failure events. Now, sadly, the Deliver authors did not tell us at ESC or in their New England paper what total hospitalizations were. It's just not there. And this is a real problem because an emperor preserved heart failure hospitalizations represented less than 20% of total hospitalizations, which explains why the trial did not find a significant reduction in hospitalizations for any cause. If you're a 72-year-old person with HEFPEF, you don't care what a hospitalization is for. You only care about not being in the hospital for any reason. And heart failure hospitalization can only be an important surrogate endpoint if its reduction is large enough to decrease total hospitalizations. Now, this is, of course, generally the case for patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction because in those situations, low cardiac output is the dominant issue. But in patients with heart failure and a better ejection fraction, these patients are far more complex. But Deliver did not show a significantly reduced CV death. In fact, there were only 30 fewer cardiovascular deaths in this trial of 6,200 patients and overall death was also not significantly reduced. For the KCCQ questionnaire, the mean placebo corrected difference between baseline and month eight among survivors was only 2.4 points. Recall that an increase in five is considered clinically meaningful. So my comments. Similar to Emperor Preserve, DELIVER is technically a positive trial. DAPA reduced the primary endpoint of heart failure events and CV death. Um, but this is a good example, I think, of a positive trial of a fairly low-value drug. Now, I say that as a user of SGLT2 inhibitors. The drugs have substantial benefit in patients with heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, diabetes, and CKD, and I use the drugs. But nearly all drugs have differential effects depending on the patient it is being used in. Aspen, for instance, has not been shown to have a net beneficial effect in primary prevention, but clearly has a role after MI or PCI. And consider that when SGLT2 inhibitors are used in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, there's no reduction in death, no significant reduction in CV death. The only thing they do is reduce one type of hospitalization, and in Emperor Preserve, this was not enough to reduce total hospitalizations, and in Delivers, the authors don't tell us. Well, many of the same authors here published a meta-analysis of the two trials in Lancet, and here they combined trials and still found no difference in overall mortality, but still no data on total hospitalizations. My bottom line is that if SGLT2 inhibitors cost the same as, say, furosemide, I'd be a proponent. Scientifically, there's probably a benefit to SGLT2 inhibitors in, in heart failure preserved ejection fraction, but the issue is the value at the current price is low. Now, I felt a strong push at ESC. Maybe I'm wrong, but I felt a strong push from the trialists to use these drugs in all patients with any kind of heart failure. The problem with that is cost. We in the U.S. have huge problems with disparities in access to care and outcomes. We spend more than any other country, and it doesn't translate to better outcomes. And if we burn up money in low-value uses, this only worsens the healthcare equity situation. So if I have a patient with heart failure preserved ejection fraction who, say, has diabetes or CKD, I will use SGLT2 inhibitors. But if I have a patient with heart failure preserved ejection fraction who has no other indication, I won't feel compelled to use the drug. Okay, fourth topic today is the Invictus trial comparing rivaroxaban to vitamin K antagonist in patients with rheumatic heart disease. Even though many of the listeners of this podcast don't see many patients with rheumatic heart disease, I like this trial. A few facts before we stop and think about the results. The global burden of rheumatic heart disease is substantial. It occurs most often in low- and middle-income countries 
places where INR management is also challenging. I once lectured in Mexico and learned there that patients often travel an entire day just to get an INR. And direct acting oral anticoagulants, or DOACs, have been shown non inferior to VKAs in multiple trials. However, patients with rheumatic heart disease were excluded from these trials. And rheumatic heart disease is obviously different. It often leads to a high risk of atrial thrombus, more often affects younger patients and women. Invictus had more than 70% women, and the mean age of patients was only 50 years old. Now, the theory of the trial was that even if rivaroxaban was felt to be not as potent as VKAs in rheumatic heart disease, its simplicity of use in developing countries would allow it to be non-inferior. Now, bolstering this idea was an RCT called RIVER. RIVER found rivaroxaban non-inferior to warfarin in patients with a bioprosthetic valve. There was also a South Korean observational study that found an association of lower stroke rates in patients with mitral stenosis who were treated with DOAX versus warfarin. And I want to thank Professor Bandari from Egypt for that one. Now, some methodologic comments about Invictus. About 4,500 patients, you know, randomized from 138 sites in 24 countries, Africa, Asia, South America. The primary outcome was to be stroke or systemic embolism, but the trialists noted that stroke rates were low, partially because of increased death rates. And if the endpoint were not changed, the uh, trial would have been underpowered. So they then expanded the primary endpoint to include stroke, systemic embolism, MI, or death from vascular unknown causes. They used a non-inferiority analysis, and this is literally a perfect example of why non-inferiority should be used, namely that even if rivaroxaban was similar or only a little worse than VKA, it offers the huge advantage of simplicity over VKAs. Okay, the main results. At 8.2% events per year in a rivaroxaban versus 6.49% per year in the VKA group, the hazard ratio was 1.25, and the upper bound of that hazard ratio, or worst case scenario, was 1.41, or 41% worse, and that was greater than the non-inferiority margin of 1.19, so rivaroxaban was clearly not non-inferior to VKAs. And this led to the obvious conclusion that we should continue to stick with VKAs over rivaroxaban in patients with rheumatic heart disease. But I want to delve in just a bit deeper here for fun and also for teaching purposes. The question is, why did rivaroxaban underperform? Now, one answer is that rivaroxaban did not provide enough anticoagulant effect in patients with a huge thrombotic burden like rheumatic patients. Now, if that were the case, you'd expect the driver of the primary endpoint to be stroke. But that wasn't the case. In a trial of 4,500 patients with rheumatic heart disease, there were only 19, 19 fewer strokes or systemic embolisms. That's weird. Weirder yet is the driver of the missing non-inferiority was death. 552 deaths in rivaroxaban, 442 in VKA, or 110 fewer deaths. Now, the authors speculate why this would be. Not only was it not stroke, it was also not valve deterioration, as valve surgery was the same in both groups. And it's unlikely to be harmed from rivaroxaban as the drug has protective effects against atherosclerotic vascular disease, for instance. I think the most likely possibility is a form of performance bias. That is, patients in the VKA arm have more interactions with clinicians. Now, this had no effect in the DOAC trials, but Invictus was done in developing countries, and interactions with healthcare might be more important in this setting. Nonetheless, VKA management involves interactions with healthcare systems, and maybe this is a good thing in certain situations. Perhaps it's not even a bias, but just part of the whole deal of taking VKAs. Finally, I want to congratulate the authors. Kudos to the Population Health Research Institute at McMaster's, which does a shocking amount of research. But kudos also to the leaders in developing nations, especially second author, Dr. Gannison, Kartha Kayan. You've all done a really meaningful thing, and you should feel good about it. So that's it for this week's This Week in Cardiology. Next week, I'll do more studies from the ESC. And as always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, if you like this podcast, please give us a rating. Write us even a one or two sentence review. Let us know what you think.
These things go a long way to helping others find us, and they also help me learn. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.